in your holy presence to hear your holy word. Grant us your holy spirit, that by the preaching of your word we may be brought to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow every day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We'll begin with our first hymn, hymn 972 from the Lutheran Service Book, on page 2 in your bulletin, I Trust O Christ in You Alone. Who made heaven and earth. 
If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the... Just call upon him in prayer and praise today. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this Laetare Sunday, fourth Sunday in Lent, is from Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they sent out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way 
And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. And then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9, responsively. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from trouble. And gathered in from the lands. From the east and from the west. From the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes. Finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty. Their souls fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way. Until they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. For his wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing heart. And the hungry soul he fills with good things. Our epistle reading is from Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Uh, you'll notice uh, as we're going through here that the texts for this Sunday are some of the most well-known and most beloved texts in Scripture. Uh, traditionally, this fourth Sunday is kind of known as a sort of like little, little rejoicing in the middle of Lent. You know, always we have this, this joy of the gospel, but things are a little more somber during Lent. Laetere Sunday, Laetere comes from the first word in, in the intro, which is rejoice. Um, and uh, so you, you see that with, with these texts. This, this is a perfect example of that, this text from Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ wow. Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please arise for the gospel reading. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. He has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people of the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. 
But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 571 in the Lutheran service book, God loved the world so that he gave. To whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, lifted up to salvation and everlasting life, 
through the lifting up of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Grace and peace to you. There are limits to everything in this life. There's a limit to how fast you can run. I don't know exactly what that limit is. People used to think that there was no way a human being could run a mile any faster than five minutes. Everybody was sure of it. And then Roger Bannister famously broke that barrier, and since then it seems like everyone and their mother's been breaking the five-minute barrier. I must have coached ten kids in high school who could run a mile faster than that. Today, the world record in the mile is three minutes and 43 seconds. And I'm sure at some point it'll be 3.42 or 3.41. But a point will come when no one will break the record again. Because there is a limit somewhere. There's no way a person could run a mile in, say, 30 seconds, for instance, or even a minute. Because there are limits to everything. There is a limit to how much time you have to give to some endeavor. There's a limit to how much you can do for someone who is in need. There's a limit to, sadly, to summer's gentle touch, and a limit, gladly, to the grasp of winter's frozen fingers. There is a limit to how far into the unending expanse of space man is able to reach, even if we don't quite know what that limit is yet. There's a limit to how much you can know, a limit to how much you can see and do in this lifetime, because, of course, there's a limit to how long you live. And there's a limit to how much you can love. Well, there shouldn't be. Not for those last two. And they're related to each other. The reason that there is a limit to how long you live is that there's a limit to how much you love. And one reason that there's a limit to how much you love is that there's a limit to how long you live. We were meant for life and for love. That's what God created you for. These two things which are really one thing. Love never ends, Paul says. God is love. God is life. God is light. And this is what burst forth from him in those six days of creation. It was a creation of life and love unbounded. Because God has no limit. His love never ends. His life is eternal. And that is what he meant for you, for us all. So why is our love so very limited? Why do we hide in the darkness, as John writes in our text? Hiding from the light of God's truth, lest our loveless deeds be exposed. Why do we give up so easily? Why do we grow sour at those we claim to love because they do one thing that we don't like? Or two things that annoy us? Why do we grow resentful? Why do we grow weary of doing good? Why do we use others for our designs and desires and call it love? Why do we claim that our love has no limits and then very quickly show that it does and that the limit is not very high? Because we are dead. That's how Paul began our epistle reading. He said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. See, love is life. And life is love. And this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. But we don't do that. That's why we will one day die. There is a limit to our life because of this limit on our love. We die because of sin. And this is why we are also from birth already dead. Because by nature, we don't love. And a life without love is no life at all. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. This is the entire message of Scripture. This is the message running through all of our texts, and especially in our gospel text, which we'll consider this morning, that there is no limit to the love of Christ. There is no limit to the width of his love. There is no limit to the depth of his love. And there is no limit to the length of his love. One of those limits that, that our love has is its width. We, we tend to narrow the scope of the people that we will love. Like that Pharisee saying, well, who is my neighbor? Who do I actually have to love? Because we simply do not have enough love to give, or at least are not willing to give it. There's a love that we will show to our family that we wouldn't show to our neighbor. And a love that we would show to our neighbor that we wouldn't show to a stranger on the street. 
There's a love that we would give to somebody who agrees with us that we wouldn't give to somebody who doesn't. And a love that we might have for our countrymen that we wouldn't have for somebody from another place. It's as if we draw these circles around us, ever widening, and give to each circle the allotted amount of love that is due in each one. Christ's love is not so limited. Notice two words in our text. First, the word world. God so loved the world, not a part or a piece or a country or a continent, but the whole thing without exception. And second, notice the word whoever. Jesus repeats it over and over. Whoever believes might be saved. That is, anyone. This love of the cross, this love of God, has no limit in its width. Picture the cross of Jesus. His arms flung wide upon that bloody beam. It is as if those arms are extended to embrace the whole world. It is as if they point in either direction, thus to indicate how far his love extends, both to the east and to the west and all the way around the globe. His is a love for every race and tribe and people and language. His is a love that reaches everywhere the sun shines and everywhere it does not. Consider the image that Jesus is using. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Moses lifted up that serpent, as we read in our Old Testament reading, in the midst of a people writhing and dying on the ground. The people of Israel had been bitten by fiery serpents, because of their sin. And so Moses raised that pole and the bronze serpent upon it so that anyone who looked at it would live. Anyone among the people of Israel. Anyone who had been bit. But now Jesus expands the scene. Our whole world lies writhing and dying. We, by our sins, have all been snake bit. And we all know the sting and pain of sin and death which we have caused because of the limits of our love and which in turn caused that limit on our life. Now, above this dying world, God lifts up his son on a wooden cross and he says, whoever believes in him shall not perish. Anyone. There is no limit in those words. No limit of race, no limit of place, no limit of age, no limit of class or gender. None at all. God so loved the world that whoever believes might be saved. For there is also no limit to the depth of Christ's love. You know, even among those people in our closest circles, the people that we claim we love the most, that we think we might do anything for and give anything for, there is a limit, isn't there? There are times when your patience runs low, when your energy gives way and when your love fails you like a shallow pool of water vanishing in summer's heat. But there is no limit to the depth of Christ's love. Picture that cross again. See the way that it stands plunged deep within the earth. And picture another line. This one extending straight up and down forever. Just as the width of his love in those wide-flung arms has no limit, the cross also shows that the depth of God's love has no limit. Because he didn't come for those who were high up, for those who were exalted, for those who were enough, for those who were righteous. He came deep. He came low for those who were sinners, for those who were dead. He came so that by his love he might bring them who could not love him to life. Consider a single word in the text. So. God so loved the world. It means in this way. The manner and the quality and the depth of God's love is painted before you here in that he gave his only begotten son for you. No father or mother on earth has ever loved a son or a daughter half so well as the father loved his only begotten son. That was truly a love without limit. But he gave him up for you. Trained him, sacrificed him for you because he loved you so. Because he loved you that deeply. He loved you with no limit, so there was nothing he would not do and nothing he would not give 
for you. Consider another word in our text. Lift it up. I know in English it's two words, but in Greek it's one. So it counts. That's a word that Jesus often uses to talk about his death on the cross. Just as the servant was lifted up, so also the Son of Man must be lifted up. And it's kind of a weird word to do that with. It doesn't sound like it in English. I mean, we just think, oh, lift it up. Yeah, sure, you know, they lifted him up on the cross. But in Greek, that word has the implication of honor. It refers to someone being lifted up and exalted in glory as a winner. Just a bit of a strange way to speak about the greatest instrument of pain and shame and torture the world has ever known. Just before he died, Jesus said this, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified and I will glorify it again. And a few verses later, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. The humiliation of the cross, which Jesus was lifted up to pain and shame and scorn and mockery, was also glorious. It was a humble exaltation because in those great depths of degradation and suffering, we see the unmatched and unlimited love of God. He died for sinners. He paid for all the sins of all the sinners of all time. He died for those who killed him. He died for you. He died for the dead, that the dead might live. The love of the cross is like a jolt of electricity, which brings our hearts once dead in sin to beat with life and love again. His love is so great that it conquers death. It conquers the death in your hearts. It conquers the death in your bodies. And there is no limit to its width or its depth. When you feel and fear your sins, when you wonder whether Christ could love someone like you, when you feel your own love run dry, know the cross. And in knowing the cross and seeing this one lifted up from the earth and at the same time sinking to the very depths of humility and suffering, know the depth of his love. It never runs out. It is never not enough. There is no limit. There is nothing it cannot do. There is no sin not forgiven, no dark place where its light does not reach, no dead heart that it cannot bring to life and to love. For there is also a limit to the length of Christ's love. Consider again a single word in our text, the word eternal. That is, without end. Our love is limited not only in its width and depth, but also in its length. Even if you were to love someone perfectly, your love would still be limited because you would die. Death is the ultimate limitation. You can't love someone when you are dead. But Christ's love is not limited by death. For love, true love, the love of the cross is stronger than the grave. Christ loved you so well when he died for you, so widely and so deeply that the grave itself was burst apart by the strength of his love. And that's why eternal life is yours. Eternal life, because eternal love is yours. And this, our text says, has already begun. For whoever believes in him has eternal life. Not will have, has. Now. Because in you, his love has already created this new life, which is the only life there is. It's a life that lives by his love and is fed by his love. That is why it loves. And this is why John in our text speaks about light, darkness, and good works, and wicked ones. Notice what he says in verse 18. Whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. In other words, the judgment has already taken place. The one who believes has already passed from death to life and already begins to love, that is, to do good works. The believer's works are counted as good because the believer is counted as good, because his or her sins are all forgiven. All the darkness is removed by the light of Christ's own love. This is the light that never ends. Because this light of love, which Christ's love lights in your hearts, will only grow. All it needs is love. And it has as its source Christ's unlimited love, which is wide and deep 
and long, oh, so very long, lasting into endless days. This is what heaven will be. Love. True love. God's love for you. God's love in you. Love that has no limit. And so when you love now, when you love your spouse and rejoice in their love for you, when you love your children and melt into their smiling faces, it's a small taste of eternity. When you love your neighbor and your friend and your brother or sister by doing those things which Christ commands, it is a little bit of heaven begun now. And if this love if this life of love should be so sweet already in the midst of a world of sin, what will love's full glory be? What will it be like to test and know the unlimited potential of love in the life to come? What will it be like to stretch and light and joy and become who we were always meant to be? Love and life and light. See them now already in the cross of Jesus. A love that has no limit. A love wide and deep and long. A love for you. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, I just realized that I forgot to put one of the hymns in the bulletin. And it's the one titled, How Wide the Love of Christ. <laughs> um, we'll continue with the prayers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great grace and mercy to us in Jesus Christ, that though we were dead and lost in sin, you sent your only begotten Son into the flesh so that we might live through him. We thank you for your love, so vast that it wakens us from the death of our sin and brings you and brings us into your very life and presence. We ask that you would ever increase in us this faith which comes by your spirit, which trusts in you alone and not in our own works. And because it trusts in you alone, it also is brought to love and good works. We ask, Lord, that every day you would strengthen us in this faith and therefore strengthen us in this love as we walk the road to eternal life. We ask, Lord, that you would bless all of our efforts to proclaim your name in this world, both as individuals and a congregation, a synod, and throughout the world. That you would bless our witness in our words, so that the gospel we speak might not return void, but would accomplish what you please and bring many to believe in you. And that you would bless our, our efforts through our works, that we might show your glory, and we might show your light to others by showing your love and what we do and back up gospel that we preach with how we live. We ask the Lord that you would forgive us for all those times when we fail to do those works which you have set before us and keep turning us ever again back to your mercy and your love as our life and our source of power and love. We ask the Lord that you would bless our world and our country and our community with wisdom and love and peace. And we ask especially for those among us, we've been asked to remember in their pains and troubles that you would bless them with healing and hope according to your will. Bless especially Don Bickham, Kaylee Beauty. Bless Gloria Longwitz, Joanne Johannes, Carol Gilbertson, Don Indiana Herzberg, and all those among us that are either isolated or sad or troubled or doubting or despairing. Give them the comfort of your own life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask all these things confident that you will hear us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. And in his name, we also rise and join to pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.
God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We'll conclude with 420. That's our new children's hymn this week as well. Notice that it's on page 9 and 10. The last three verses are on page 10. Uh, it's for those at home, is Christ the life of all the living.
Sunday school, and then after that, Bible study, um, live stream for both. Uh, continuing our midweek service this week at 6.30, I think it's Pastor Sowers that will be here for that. Um, and then, no, Pastor, Pastor Bernthal this week, and then Pastor Sowers the next week. So no communion, obviously, in either of those two services. There is communion next Sunday, and then I think the sun, Sunday after that is Palm Sunday. So there will be communion then, too, and then Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Coming up fast. So uh, I don't think I have any other announcements. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus.